The RX 6300 has finally been spied out in the wild, and unfortunately I could not catch one for my own collection. However, two other big game poachers seem to have caught them, as well as some charges. And all for what? A GB that honestly was already on the way out after it was finished. How? Why? Seriously though, I was hoping to get my hands on this card as soon as I first heard about it over a year ago. Join the Discord, by the way. And for once, I am happy that I wasn't an early adopter because, man, this GPU is just a pile of e-waste. Oh wait, we we are looking at its predecessor. Just, just, just ignore it. I'm, I'm doing an intro. All right, so I'm not reviewing the RX 6300, technically, sort of, but rather its predecessor. And I will get into all the details as to why as we move along. But first, let's introduce this stranger to the family. The RX 5300, released on May 28th, 2020. It is a Navi 14 based GPU, which means it is a car that has RDNA architecture that can utilize fun stuff like FSR, which is great considering it is the slowest card in its lineup and has the lowest amount of VRAM, three gigs, out of all of the cards in its series. But hey, at least it still has driver support, GDDR6 memory, and a sleek looking shroud. Man, I miss the old biz no play style. <clears throat> At launch, it costed around $130, which is okay, could be better, but isn't unreasonable for a brand new GPU, especially for its specs in 2020. It is fast enough and should do well, but wait, why are we looking at just this GPU? Shouldn't we have the RX 6300 side by side to compare performance and specs and whatnot? Well, to answer that question, no, because one, I am not spending $200 on this garbage because you can only get it new from Dell or otherwise you would have to patiently wait on eBay to spot it and hope that it doesn't cost more than $20 because the value of this thing is terrible. And two, it's garbage. We will get into why that is exactly the case here in a moment. I don't want to own the card, but thankfully those poachers from the beginning did some of the dirty work for me already, which means I am going to borrow some of the frame data that they were able to collect in order to show you why you shouldn't spend more than even 20 bucks for this pile of PCB and silicon. But let's start off with first impressions and see what the whole plug and play setup process is like. I installed our RX 5300, plugged it in with a 6-pin power connector, and booted up my test bench. Windows gave it some random drivers it found online immediately, and I went with those because they seemed to be the latest to me. I booted up Red Dead Redemption 2 and was immediately met with a message stating that my drivers were out of date and that my PC did not meet the minimum VRAM spec requirements. Strange. I have never seen Red Dead do this, and also weirdly enough, the game booted anyways. Cool. I guess. Once in settings, I noticed immediately things were a little haywire, but I'm sure this is fine. After all that, I turned up texture quality and kept everything low in the settings. I was doing this specifically to match Random Gaming and HD's data from his review of the RX 6300 to see how much better its predecessor would perform compared to its successor, all things considered. And barely even starting my bench test with the same settings? I was getting over nearly three times better results than what the RX 6300 was producing in Random Gaming in HD's video. It didn't stutter really or drop below 60 during the bench despite what the actual benchmark results thinks it saw, but the 75 FPS average was correct enough though as far as I could tell. Pretty cool. Now, it was time to crank up settings and really see what we could do. However, after this bench I noticed that all my settings were locked out as in I couldn't adjust them and apply those set settings. Not cool. So this is when I looked for new drivers, which was a bit of a struggle because I was under the assumption that they would be hard to find like the RX 6300s were. In Iceberg Tech's review of the card, he noted the difficult process of trying to get what could be the latest drivers for his transistor paperweight. And since this is an OEM Dell GPU, the drivers from Dell were last released in July of 2023. See where the problems might start arising here? Anyways, I wasn't going to bother with Dell, considering that I wouldn't get anywhere new with them on this OEM GPU myself. So I tried using DriverEasy, which said that I already had the latest drivers. I checked out multiple sketch websites that were too risky even for my 
Free download now, tastes. And caved in and just said, AMD Adrenaline, please work. To which, it did work. Cool. <laughs> but seriously, I thought this was going to be a lot scarier considering that in comparison, the RX 6300's best bet for getting drivers to work with this GPU that are not outdated is to use RID or its previously well-known name, NIMS, for driver support. Which isn't super bad for an enthusiast since it isn't complicated to install drivers through them. But the point is, once again, the RX 5300 is much better to work with here. And we haven't even gotten through the rest of our benchmark results. Upon returning to Red Dead, I was no longer met with messages stating that my GPU was outdated, that it understood that it indeed had VRAM this time, and I was able to finally crank up our settings as best as I could. I turned up everything to medium, and boosted up texture settings to nearly max out our memory, and was hoping for a 60 FPS average. And honestly, once again, despite what the benchmark said was the result, this might as well be running at a close average 60 FPS here. The game looked and felt a ton better, ran very smooth, and while it did fall under 50 FPS at one notable section of this benchmark, this is very manageable and usable for what it's worth, if you don't mind messing with settings from time to time. This is very playable, and for a 1080p experience, I can't find too much to complain about. And to the very least, we aren't running out of video memory in comparison here. <laughs> now. Let's go on ahead and move on to another title. Cyberpunk 2077 was notably shaky in terms of staying playable in Iceberg Tech's video on the RX 6300, but wasn't impossible to run. I matched his settings with mine, and no surprise, our frame data doubled theirs. I'm sure I could crank up settings and still get a 40 FPS average if I really wanted to, but I think the point has been mostly made about this card for the moment. I do have a few more games to show later, but I want to sort of explain and talk about why these cards exist, why they suck or don't suck, and some of the confusing information and sad truths about them. Well, specifically the RX 6300, but you, you get what I mean. So, why was a card released in the same class from 2020 better than a card that was never released? I mean, it was released. What? Okay. One of the simple answers here is target goals. The R6300 and 5300 were both made to reach certain specs and demands, to which system integrators like Dell went for their desktop computers, to which AMD delivered on those listed requirements. In many cases, you could buy them outright, but at weird prices or through the system integrators themselves. This isn't a new business practice as there have been many GPUs or just hardware components in general in the past that have been downgrades, underclocks, overclocks, or whatever of certain hardware to meet certain specs for various reasons. This is why the graphics processor of the RX 300 is just a downgrade RX 6500 XT. Same thing goes for the RX 5300. Wait, it, it doesn't? Okay, so. The RX 5300 is technically a downgrade RX 5500 XT, as they both share the same Navi 14 graphics processor, but with some minor spec differences in their final product. But unlike the RX 6300 and 6500 XT, which does share the same Navi 24 graphics processor, there were huge differences in things like shader units, memory bus width, and clock speeds. Directly comparing the specs of the 5300 and 5500 XT, you will see and understand the differences in the same way you would if it were something like comparing it because two sandwiches have nearly the exact same ingredients and toppings and whatever. But the RX 6300 is way off. One big example of this is the memory bus being half of the RX 6500 XT, which I am sure severely affects its performance given that was the memory bus of the PlayStation 1 in 1994. Considering it probably doesn't have more than two RAM chips on the board as well, it will probably perform as fast as it truly can go. And listen, I could go on about numbers and features and why good versus bad, but this still doesn't ultimately answer the bigger question here. If Dell made pre-builds in the past showing the RX 5300 and PCs that had different uses and cases, why would they ask AMD to give them or make them a successor, but this time way, way worse than its last iteration and ship out products to customers that now receive hardware that is basically already on its way out the door? The answer? I don't know for certain, but I think it could be money related, like most things. Or maybe it's logistics. 
The RX 5300 takes up two PCIe slots, has a PCIe 4.0 and an X8 interface, needs a six pin power connector and a fair amount of airflow so that it doesn't thermal throttle despite having a good heatsink and fan. The RX 6300 is a small form factor card which works in low profile systems, has a PCIe 4.0 X4 interface, but also has a small heatsink which needs just a little airflow to get the bare essentials done and for both Dell and AMD is cheaper to make and throw into computers most definitely. This card is going to work with many Dell pre-builds because it doesn't have 20, 30 requirements in the way to work for a certain system because of what size the PC is or what power it needs and whatnot. 32 whole watts, that's some GT1030 biceps right there. And that is what matters to Dell the most, basic function. They probably wanted this for systems that had no integrated graphics on board or couldn't use the CPU in a specific case for whatever reason. Or if someone needed to order a replacement GPU for an older system at a big company who needs a couple of cheap display outs. I mean, to us, it isn't cheap. I would rather delete my channel than pay $200 for this. But I think the requirements that Dell probably thought of or asked for for this GPU ended up being a waste of work in parts in the end, since I can't find really any redeeming factors about this card, which is why I won't even buy it to compare it to every game I have shown. Oh, by the way, check out Iceberg Tech and Random Gaming and HD's videos on the card. They did some interesting data dives on the GPU. Thanks for making the videos, guys. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, all the while, its predecessor is just, it's just good. I could point out all sorts of stuff about it, like how it has a four gigabyte variant of it somewhere if you look hard enough, and that it is also ITX in most cases and whatnot, but it is just a good budget GPU. I got it for roughly 60 bucks, and if it was 50 or especially 40 for the three gigabyte variant, I could think of way worse cards to waste that kind of money on. It has a lot of life in it still, especially if you mostly play older games, obviously, or just any titles if you aren't a fan of the latest AAA 6v6 shooters that get churned out every six months. And sure, it isn't the best. Like I said, it needs plenty of tweaking in order for it to run games at a decent frame rate. And in a worst case scenario like Helldivers 2, I found it uncomfortable to use as I had to keep lowering my settings more and more until it hovered over 30 FPS no problem. But that is to be expected out of a budget entry level card from almost four years ago at this point. The RX 6300 is barely a year old, and it was outdated when it was released, and it won't even run some AAA games that were even set free into the wild all that long ago. There are better low profile, small form factor GPUs that cost less than the sorry excuse of a graphics card that deliver extremely good performance for a value less than 200 bucks. With how weird and volatile the lower mid range or entry level market has been lately, I hope this doesn't become a trend in the near future, because if a mid-range card from over 10 years ago that could run you $20 today runs nearly as good or even better than the RX 6300 now, we are truly going to end up with problems way sooner than later. Ah, <sighs> man, this was a fun video to make, and helped me learn some interesting data on these newer entry-level GPUs and much, much more. Thanks to Iceberg Tech for letting me use some of his frame data for cross-referencing. Also, thanks to Random Gaming and HD for his, even though I didn't ask for permission because I am not big enough yet to talk to the overlords of the YouTube tech kingdom. <laughs> but seriously, guys, thanks, thanks for your videos. Let me know if I miss anything on these cards, by the way, you the viewer, or comment if you have one of them and tell me all about your experiences using them. I would truly like to hear how bad or good it might actually be. If you want to support me, you can become a member on YouTube, by the way. It is only 99 cents a month, and I would greatly appreciate it if you did. Also, like the video if you haven't, subscribe for more, yada yada yada. Oh, and as always, thanks for watching.